What about Vietnam? A podcast with Gary Newsom. The series where Gary talks with travelers about their experiences and adventures. Find out more about Vietnam from the people who have actually been there. What about Vietnam? Whether it's adventure, exploring the culture and cuisine, shopping, or just soaking up the sun. Let Carrie and her travellers pave the way for a magical holiday in Vietnam. What about Vietnam? Xin chào and welcome to What About Vietnam. Today I'm talking to the lovely Cynthia Mann and I'm going to be talking to her about a recent trip that she did to a place called Mai Chau. Now Mai Chau is one of those places a little bit off the grid, uh, about three hours out of Hanoi, but an absolutely wonderful experience if you are looking for uh, a place in Vietnam that uh, can take you back in time in some ways as it features uh, the the minority groups, the Hmong people and the Thai people. Cynthia uh, has a lot to do with these ethnic communities as she operates a business called Future Traditions and has a showroom in Hanoi, which I strongly recommend that you pop in. Using the traditional weaving and textiles of the Hmong people uh, and uh, the Thai people, she's been able to create the most amazing contemporary designs uh, in homewares and in fashion wear. So definitely a person in the know and with lots of years of experience uh, in the area. She was able to join us today from Hanoi and tell us a little bit about her trip and I hope you'll welcome her to the show. Welcome Cynthia to the program. Thank you, nice to be here. Great to have you on the show. Look, uh, today I'm going to be picking your brains about a trip that you did recently to uh, one of my favourite places called Mai Chau. Tell us a little bit about where Mai Chau is, where it's actually located and how, you know, like how you get there, just so we can kick things off. Sure. Um, I mean, one of the nice things about it in Mai Chau is that it's actually uh, like a drive from Hanoi. So it doesn't require flights. It's uh, maybe three hours now. There's quite good road to get there. So you can leave in the morning and be there for lunch. It's in the mountains, beautiful valleys, um, it's it's um, mostly ethnic minority villages in the area. It, Micro town itself is quite small. Um, it's got a really nice kind of rural feel and community um, to it. Uh, there's some beautiful, uh, there's beautiful waterfall. Um, there's the fantastic Wabing Lake, which um, we're going to talk about. It is. Um, it's a, it's a, just a really fantastic place to get away from it all. Um, and I don't really know why people, I mean, I know Safa is spectacular, um, but my, uh, my show has everything and you can jump on a bicycle and be riding around the villages really easily. It's a lot less physically demanding than Safa, um, but yes. absolutely, yeah, not as touristy, which I guess is but- part of the deal. Exactly, and I think um, I think you made a good point about uh, referring it to Sapa. I mean, Sapa kind of sits very high on the the tourist map, but uh, my Chow uh, traditionally hasn't, mm. and um, I'm not sure why. Because, like you, I found it fascinating. I was, I went there about three years ago, and but I, I had to like ask my travel agent to to create this tour for me because, you know, they said, oh, you know, not many people know about my chow. And I went, well, I, I, I want to see it. I want to, I want to experience it. So, uh, so where did you stay and why did you choose the place you stayed? Okay. Well, I mean, traditionally, I mean, I first started going to my chow in about 2008 and there really was only homestays and one um, uh, what they called an echo lodge. Echo lodge. Yeah, and now that's where I stayed. Yeah, and now there. Well, there's two echo lodges. One on the road, and then there's this beautiful big one um, uh, set on in the back. Hill, yeah, at the back, which is stunning. Yes, that's the one I stayed, yeah. stayed at near the Paco Village. Yes, and now there's quite a lot of diff- of, of um, uh, places to stay. But this where I stayed was called the Micro Hideaway, and it's actually about fifteen to twenty k's out of Micho town 
um, on the edge of Wabing Lake, which is this huge hydroelectric lake. Very, very beautiful. One of the biggest in Southeast Asia. Um, so you've got all of the options of kind of water activities like kayaking and, and things like that. Um, and it, we really went after lockdown. We just wanted to have a bit of a getaway and, and <laughs> feel like we were human again. Escape the world. Well, escape the world, but in a sense, you know, um, at that during lockdown, I was I was locked in a house by myself, so I was really a bit desperate mm. to talk to people <laughs> and, um, and right, and have yes, normality, and and that was it was fantastic uh, to be there. It's a really lovely. Place. So now you mentioned that the uh, my Chow place you stayed at was a homestay. No, no, the, the place we stayed, we used to, that used to be the only option. But now this was a, uh, this is kind of a, um, I guess it's probably a uh, four-star kind of hotel. Four-star? Yeah. Uh, okay. And what would the average night stay there be just roughly for cost? for our guests to understand price-wise? Uh, that's a good question. I don't, I can't remember because we got a special deal and I think it was maybe it's about a hundred, hundred and something. In the, about in the hundred market. US? Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, around that mark, I think. Might have to check on that one. And so <laughs> a, as a list of things to do around my chow, um, what would be like your top three things to do uh, if you base yourself at the hideaway? Um, what would you do? Um, if you've never been to Mai Cho, I would go into Mai Cho town and spend some time in the kind of tourist villages there because uh, it's the ethnic Thai villages. Um, they, you can see some weaving. Uh, they have a lot of um, textiles on sale. Obviously, my first love is textiles. Um, and they Absolutely. <laughs> both um, Hmong and, um, and Thai there. Um, also, I would go on one of the cruises on the cruise. Actually, sounds a bit glamorous. It's kind of one of those, you know, putt putt. <laughs> That's a good point. Uh, yes. A putt putt boat um, onto Wabing Lake. Yeah. Um, particularly <laughs> just before sunset. So you head down the the, the reservoir, um, and then um, we had dinner at this amazing um, this amazing dinner at this fish farm. So we cruised down the lake which was gorgeous it's a little bit like I mean it looks and feels a little bit like Halong Bay on the land you know you've got these amazing kind of formations coming out of the the water Um, and then on the as we turned around to come back for dinner uh, you're heading into the sunset which was absolutely stunning was really really beautiful Um, and the dinner was incredible we were the only guests there Uh, they cooked up amazing array of fish um, dishes and all sorts of different ones, barbecued and uh, various others, and it was just delicious. Um, and then we... So can you can you explain a little bit about that fish restaurant? Because if I, if I got, if I've got it right, it's a fish farm. Yeah, absolutely. That sits in the middle of the lake. Yep. And now they've built a restaurant around it, is that right? Yeah, in the middle, yeah. So it's basically a a series of pontoons. Um, They have the fish farm. It's actually reasonably close to the edge of the lake. It's not like in the the middle. It's it's in a little cove. Um, They they get um, farm the fish and supply that to the area, and I think they also uh, send it up to to Hanoi and probably down to Ho Chi Minh as well. and uh, then they've got this sort of pontoon area where they then, and they have a kitchen, They the, the people farming live there. Um, and, you know, they've got a couple of dogs living there and a couple of cats and, you know, the whole shebang. Um, <laughs> it's very local. Yeah, yeah. very local. I, didn't, I have to admit I didn't notice any chooks, but, you know, they could have been hiding, hiding around the corner, um, <laughs> as they normally are. Um, and you sit, you know, they said they've got table a table set up or tables um, where you sit and they just they bring out the food and you can have a, you know, a cool drink yeah. or a beer. Or I'm so glad that's happened because when I was there, they were building it and I actually walked away with a piece of the bamboo that they were using uh, to, to walk away and I planted a, 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 a plant inside it back 
back at home when I got home. God knows how I got it through um, customs or whatever, <laughs> blah, 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 but I, but I did. Anyway, uh, you know, so I knew of the plans that they had in vogue to create this restaurant. So it's great to hear that they've done that, finished that, got it up and running, and, and now you as a foreign tourist have been there to try it. So I'm really, really pleased um, that that's happened, and I'm, I'm sure tourists coming into the region are going to love it. Now, I want to hit back on something that I know you're going to be able to speak uh, to everyone a lot about, and that's about the ethnic communities and about those textiles that we talk about with what you offer in future traditions and and, and through your, your handcrafts and your work and, and those beautiful designs you do. So can you talk a little bit about the, the village, the textiles and the, the ethnic communities in the area. Tell us a bit uh, about that. Sure. Um, I think uh, when, I was, when I was down there, I actually also did a bit of business. I have um, some textile producers down there. So, of course, I met with them while I was there. Um, it's predominantly ethnic Thai and Hmong um, communities down there. Um, the Hmong are famous for batik and uh, embroidery, the Thai for their weaving. So um, it's it's great to be able to, if you go into my church town and to the little villages behind the town, um, to see the weaving. Um, they do a lot of scarves. It's, it's incredibly um, uh, affordable to, to buy a piece of hand woven hand loom. Um, do they still hang the bedspreads on the the line? Uh, yeah, they do. They do. Um, I bought one. Okay, yeah. I want to they, know. they make those from they they're actually made from recycled Hmong skirts. They're not actually Thai at all. Um, they're taking the oh, okay. the, the beautiful um, Hmong skirts, gathered skirts that are made from a number of different pieces. Um, featuring batik and applique and embroidery. And uh, they deconstruct those and then make them into uh, those kind of blankets um, or sheets or, or bedspreads, whatever you want to call them. Um, and, and that's where my interest, I guess one of the interests I have is that what you see now often is my, it also has um, printed polyester fabric that looks the same, looks the same patterns, but is no longer handmade because it's cheaper for them to buy it in from China um, to, and then just to sew the skirt. Because for a long traditional um, woman's um, clothing, it can take, out, obviously, outside of doing other things like growing rice and harvesting and all those things, um, it can take a year for them to make a new piece of clothing, which they usually do wow. for to see the new year in. So everybody in the family will get a new set of clothing for the new year if they can afford to do that. Um, and so, but but now it's, you know, there are quicker and cheaper ways to do it, um, which is on one hand great because it's cheaper and it's quicker and everybody, you know, that gives them more time to do other things and perhaps potentially earn more money. But it also means that those I guess integral um, cultural traditional skills, traditions, mm. um, the skills, and also just that the look is is being diminished. So, um, one of the things I do is um, I have been commissioning, uh, for instance, the batik, um, new batik to be made. Um, I work with um, a couple of ladies in one of the villages um, outside, kind of on the. Maicho Mokcho border, um, province border, um, who do the hand stitched applique ribbon, um, which is a traditional form of the skirts, um, which they sew onto the skirts usually in red, black and white. Um, the red has got a bit of a floral to it and then the black and white little squares on it. Um, because now you can buy a similar, uh, a facsimile of that from China that's machine made. Um, it's, it's cheap. You just go and buy it and then you can stick it straight on their skirt. So it's it doesn't take long. But then that actual craft is, is being kind of lost. So I it's mm. one of the things that I first fell in love with the first time I went to the Paco market. I saw it and went, ah, I have to have some of that and I have to 
mm. to use that. And um, so what's happened is over time, I've worked with the, some of the ladies there who make it and I've given them fabric in different colour schemes so that they, they then produce um, a version of it for me that then fits in with a, some uh, colour scheme that I'm working with for the next collection. Um, and that's been... It, that's really good to know. Yeah, it's been great doing that. And with the boutique, um, whilst those bedspreads are recycled old skirts, um, and I have used, and I do use that in some of like my signature jackets, which are all made from some antique fabrics. I that's going to run out, and I don't want. I I didn't want to see that. I was just using recycled. I want to commission new fabric to be made. So I've also um, been working with uh, women in in a different part of uh, and just outside of the Parko village, who um, make batik specifically for me. That I so it's new boutique which I use and incorporate into my clothing. So um, just to to recap on on where that's situated, the the Paco uh, village that um, that you refer to is actually kind of at the back door of where I was staying last time. Um, so that uh, eco lodge that set up on the hill, you can actually go down the back and kind of enter it so no, they're, through the back. They're the little villages that are set up between, that's different places. Oh, okay. So that's great. And that's there is for like that, it's behind, the, it's between your lodge and the lodge you stay at and the town and it's in the back there. That's the yeah. three that all kind of, what we're originally set up as sort of tourist village. It's pretty basic. Where There's I'm not talking much about there. Parker Market. Yeah, Parker Parco Village itself is actually a uh, an, uh, a genuine. I'm not going to a, a village, a Hamong village. They have a local market there on a Sunday morning. Um, yeah, I didn't it's get to about that. twenty kilometres. Uh, it's kind of like a triangle between the town where you were, um, uh, the, the Huabing Lake, and Paco Village, so it's a kind of triangle um, distance. So it's about another 15 k's um, from my my two okay. away. So that that helps me try and uh, estimate then from a a stay's perspective. How long would you suggest a person should plan a stay there? Is it a is it a day trip? It is it an overnight trip, two or three days? What would you recommend? Um, definitely an overnight. Um, if you want to go to the Parco Market, which is is a lovely, really lovely, very small market, very very few tourists. So I hate saying that. I hate even mentioning it on on this podcast because now it'll be. Don't overrun. Just be gentle. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know I what you like mean. Turning into supper, but it is a very really nice, very low key local market on a Sunday morning, only then. That's the only time you can go there and you need to go there early, be there by, you know, 7.30, 8 o'clock, it's over by 10. Um, okay. And I would stay, ideally stay two nights. Um, if you stay somewhere like the, the um, Maito Hideaway, then you've got time to do things on the, the, um, the lake, which is, you know, gorgeous. Or if you stay somewhere like the Echo Lodge in the back in the village uh, in the valley behind Macho Town, then you can hire a bicycle and just cycle around and see different villages and um, you know talk to the local experience the local really, town. You know, it's yes. it's a really really lovely valley to to explore, and it's really easy to explore. You know, it's very so now. I just to just to clarify on the timing, you you went in we think around about June. Yeah, yeah. Um, so because you and I just love the heat, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, like for when we're recommending this for people to visit that area, the time I went was actually quite cool. Yes. So I went in. I think I was like. February, March. Yeah. So I was rugged up. It yeah. was it was quite it was quite chilly. 
but you went in Jul- June. Where where would you think are the good months to go from a timing perspective? Autumn is always. I mean, autumn in the north is probably anywhere in the north is probably the best season. So September, October, November. Um, it, September, October, yeah. November. Once you get to December, January, it can be quite and February can, can be quite cold, um, tends not to be as humid there, which is, is kind of, uh, is nice, uh, um, for especially for tourists who are not used to it. Um, but, uh, yeah, because when we were there, I mean, I was chatting with some friends on, online and they're saying, oh, I bet you're enjoying the cooler weather down there. And, and I looked and went, actually, it's exactly the same heat. You know, it was 39 degrees in Maicho mm-hmm. and in Hanoi. So, you know, it was no different. Um, it's not as high and as cool as somewhere like Sapa, um, but it's also tends not to be as humid. So for a lot of people, that's, you know, a big relief. Um, but I think, yeah, I mean, October, September. Yeah, October. I, I think any time in the middle of the year, yeah. Anywhere in Vietnam is pretty warm. It's hot. Let's face it. And you also once you know we've just entered now. It's it's you know towards the end of July, and we're just starting our rain the rainy season. So um, it will be more overcast, and then you will have have rain. On the other hand, you know the rain cools everything down. You know, on Sunday we had this huge downpour, and a tower friend of mine and I did a cycle around West Lake in the cool and it was like oh wow I haven't felt this for a long time it was just blissful delicious yes I know the feeling so Cynthia look great great to chat about my chow uh sounds like you had a really great time and um, and I'm I'm glad you were able to uh I guess uh put together that commission work that you talk about as as far as uh, with the the ethnic uh, community. So I'm, I'm a bit like you. I'm a bit of a fan of trying to keep those traditions alive for as long as we can. Absolutely. Uh, so uh, just wanted to to say thanks again and uh, we'll be chatting soon. Excellent. All righty. And uh, stay, care, you know, stay safe, everybody, and look after yourselves and um, look forward to seeing you in Hanoi um, or Vietnam at some stage in the hopefully not too distant future. Yes, me too. It was great talking to Cynthia about my chow. Please refer to the episode notes for details of future traditions uh, and also the accommodation that Cynthia stayed at, the my chow hideaway, which looks absolutely delightful. Uh, Please subscribe. It's free. It means that when new episodes come out, you'll be notified or please uh, refer to your preferred channel, be that Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcasts, etc. Look forward to talking with you soon. Thank you for listening. Check out the episode notes for more information. What about Vietnam? Don't forget to subscribe, rate and review and stay tuned for more fun adventures in Vietnam. What about Vietnam?